So the Mac hardware with the Apple M1 arrives tomorrow. And judging from performance on other Apple Silicon, Mac fans should be extremely excited. What's up everybody, this is Jeff Benjamin with 9to5Mac. So recently Final Cut Pro 10 was updated as a universal application, which means that it is now optimized for the M1 Apple Silicon inside the new MacBook Air, MacBook Pro, and Mac Mini. And this hardware should allow for faster rendering, better playback performance, better export capability, even for high quality footage like 4K ProRes, or 8K ProRes. And I also imagine that it will perform pretty well for more complex types of video like H.265, HEVC. If you've ever tried to play back one of those videos, you know the Mac with Intel processors can struggle mightily. We'll talk about that in just a little bit, but here you can see some of the testing conducted that fourth bullet point, which pertains to the MacBook Air with the eight core GPU, 16 gigabytes of RAM, two terabyte SSD, able to play two streams of 4K UHD video at the same time, 24 frames per second. And of course, with the MacBook Air being thermally throttled because it doesn't have any fans, the MacBook Pro can better handle sustained performance over a longer period of time. And in Apple's example, they, they cite using an 8K video uh, which is impressive, right? Being able to play 8K footage on a more or less entry-level MacBook Pro. So given Apple's recent history with chip design, I think it's obvious that you should be very excited for what this new Mac hardware can mean for editing videos in Final Cut Pro 10. So again, all of the new Macs, including the MacBook Pro, the MacBook Air, and the Mac Mini feature this Apple Silicon, the M1 chip, and that means that all the benefits of the M1 chip come to all three of these devices. But the really cool thing is the vertical integration. So Apple makes Final Cut Pro, they make compressor, they make motion. They also make the operating system that these apps run on. They also make the APIs that talk to the hardware. And of course, with these new Macs, they make the most important part of the whole equation. And that is the silicon, the system on a chip, the Apple M1. And really no other PC manufacturer can compete with this top to bottom vertical integration that Apple has because of its prowess with design. So what this means is that Apple is able to optimize Final Cut Pro 10 in a way that they weren't able to do before on Intel Macs. And remember that Apple also has the GPU, the CPU, the neural engine, they have unified memory, they have all the various system controllers that they've customized and optimized. And that's not even to mention just the sheer performance of these chips have been crazy for a long time on the iPad and on the iPhone. So this isn't something that's like brand new. So the M1 gives you four high efficiency cores and four high performance cores. And it can decide when to use each set of cores depending on the task. And I think it's just cool that you get an eight core CPU in a MacBook Air. That just sounds crazy to me, but that is the reality of the situation. You can see better performance across the board when compared to a leading PC laptop chip. Now, of course, take that with a grain of salt because we don't know exactly what chip Apple's comparing these to, but benchmarks are already showing some impressive performance for the M1, so stay tuned. But it's not just the CPU, it's also the GPU, an eight core or seven core in some instances GPU, with again, across the board, better performance. And the 16 core neural engine, which could be extremely useful in video editing environments, think about censoring or in implementing captions on the fly, just so many areas you could go with that. And like I was saying, here's one of the very first benchmarks using Geekbench for those M1 Macs. And you can see all three of them showcase single core performance that's better than any Intel Mac out there, period. Now, obviously, Benchmarks don't tell the whole story, especially over a sustained period of time for those fanless MacBook Airs, but nonetheless impressive. What's really impressive though, is that this benchmark isn't actually native. It's actually running under the Rosetta 2 emulator. Yeah, you read that right. It's not even a universal app and you still get performance like this. That is impressive. But again, keep in mind, benchmarks don't tell the whole story. But that being said, another graphics benchmark shows that the M1 chip outperforms the GeForce GTX 1050 Ti. Now, I know you're thinking to yourself, the 1050 Ti, that's old, it's slow. Yes, but remember, this is an integrated GPU. This is not a discrete GPU. You're getting this type of performance directly from the Apple M1. It makes me remember that a few years ago with the 2016 MacBook Pro, I was looking for better gaming performance. So what did I do? I actually built an eGPU using, yes indeed, a GeForce GTX 1050 Ti 
And that actually made the situation a lot better. Games were much more playable. It wouldn't let you game at 4K at ultra settings or anything like that, but it was definitely respectable. Folks, judging from these benchmarks, the M1 is giving you that type of performance in a low voltage integrated package that sips power. But now let's talk about the real reason for this video. We know the M1 is capable in a lot of areas, but how will it do with Final Cut Pro 10? Well, since I don't have an M1 Mac in hand just yet, I should be getting it tomorrow. We're gonna to look at this from a slightly different angle, but still you're gonna see the relevancy here. So I have Final Cut Pro 10 open. I have a 4K timeline, and then I've imported an 8K 8192 by 4320 10 bit HEVC video into this timeline. And I'm running at better quality with original media playback. So I haven't transcoded this H.265 8K 10 bit video at all. So you can see the timeline, it is completely unrendered. And I'm going to just play back. And you're going to see, yeah, it ain't doing too well. Look at that frame rate. <laughs> it's absolutely terrible. Now you're probably thinking, Jeff, what are you running this on? Is it a MacBook Air from like 10 years ago? No, we'll talk about what this machine is here in just a second, it may surprise you. But as you can see, the, the performance is terrible, just on playback. And there's no effects added to this particular clip at all. It's just straight out of the camera, added to the timeline. It's a 4K timeline and yeah, it doesn't do too well. So what we're gonna do here now is we're going to export this video to H.265 10-bit using a compressor setting. Um, and let's go ahead and do that right now. So we'll just click the share menu. I've created this compressor setting beforehand. And here we go. So this is gonna export a 4K H.265 10-bit video. So we'll go ahead and name it and save it. And now we have our Mr. Stopwatch open. And we're just gonna to count to see how long it takes to export this 45 second clip. So it's not, not doing too well there, it's kinda of slow. What type of Mac is this, you may be wondering? Oh, it's just a Mac Pro with 28 cores, 512 gigabytes of RAM, a W5700X GPU with 16 gigabytes of memory. So it's understandable why this export is so slow, and why video playback on the timeline is so slow, right? <laughs> It's absurd. Okay, so you can see we're at three minutes and we're almost done. And there we go, three minutes, seven seconds to export this 8K video in a 4K timeline to 4K H.265. So I'm gonna go to the finder, to the original media source. Here it is, the original clip that's straight out of the camera. We're gonna open that up with QuickTime. I'm gonna Command I to open up the inspector. We just wanna confirm what we're working with here. So this source video was HEVC, 8K 10 bit, 29.97 frames per second, 45 second clip. So what I'm going to do now, and this is why I say you should be excited for Apple Silicon on the Mac. I'm going to transfer this over to my iPad Pro from 2020 with that A12Z system on a chip. And here it is. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna import that 8K video into LumaTouch. Even though LumaTouch doesn't officially support 8K, it does work on a 4K timeline. So here we go. And look at playback. It is pretty much buttery smooth. 8K video on a 4K timeline on my iPad Pro with Apple Silicon. Playback, look at that. Now there is a little stutter there, but now it's playing back smooth. Wow. I mean, consider the difference between this little guy right here and that decked out Mac Pro. There's no comparison in performance. It's crazy. Now the thing is, you're working from an iPad Pro, right? So you don't have Final Cut Pro 10. You don't have the form factor of a laptop or a desktop. You don't have the, the peripheral or the IO capability of a Mac. You're missing a lot here working from an iPad Pro. Lots of power, but you just don't have the, the conveniences that you would have on a Mac. And that's why this is so exciting because basically you're taking that Apple Silicon, putting it into a Mac with all the conveniences that come with that. Now in this example, it's not exactly apples to apples because LumaFusion doesn't support HEVC 10-bit. Uh, so it's gonna export as an 8-bit file, which is obviously gonna be a lot less intense and the Mac will actually handle an 8-bit HEVC file 
with ease. It'll export that quickly. Uh, so really not an apples to apples comparison here. So with that in mind, what I've done is I've opened up iMovie on my iPhone 12 Pro Max. And what I've done is I've inserted a dummy clip at the very beginning, a HDR dummy clip that I shot with this phone. And I do that because when iMovie detects that there's an HDR clip inside, it gives you the option of enabling HDR for export, which is 10 bit. If you don't have that HDR file and there's a dummy clip, you never get the HDR option. So what I've done is I included that dummy clip. I put in the, the 10 bit file that I exported on the Mac that is in 4k because 8k is not compatible on the iPhone. And then I went through the export. So again, not apples to apples by any means, but that kind of, kind of makes my point is that you have a lot of restrictions, a lot of things you cannot do on the iPhone or on the iPad, whereas you wouldn't have those type of restrictions on a full fledged Mac computer, which is what makes the prospects of having the power that you have on the iPad or the iPhone in this instance, in a form factor and with the software of a Mac, having those two things combined together Wow, I, I think we're gonna see some really impressive stuff tomorrow. So what do you guys think? Do you think I'm blowing this whole thing out of proportion? Do you think I'm excited over nothing? Do you think it's not a big deal? Or do you see why this is such a big deal? Not just because of now, but because of what the future holds for Mac computers with Apple Silicon. Remember, this is just the very beginning. Can you think back to the S1 system on a chip for the original Apple Watch and how terribly slow that was? Can you think back on the Apple A4 and the first iPad and then the iPhone 4 compared to the A14 that we have today? That's what makes this whole thing so exciting is because it's just the beginning and yet we're already seeing incredible performance metrics and we'll no doubt see even more tomorrow and in the days ahead. So let me know what you guys think down below in the comments section. This is Jeff with 9to5Mac.